you said, uh, Michelle, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have leukemia. He says, I need you to go to the emergency room. I have a doctor waiting there for you. And I'm like, wait, what? No, I, what do you mean I have leukemia? I was winded and I was tired and I kept asking what the elevation was and I didn't understand why I couldn't breathe and why was I so tired? And I didn't realize it was because I had leukemia. Um, well, I'm a wife, a mother, a grandmother. Um, I love all of those roles. Love my kids, love my grandkids. Uh, we like to travel. Um, we, let's see, my husband and I have hobbies. We dance. We do kind of like ballroom, country, two-step, waltz, cha-cha. As a matter of fact, I was um, dancing two weeks before I was diagnosed with leukemia and just dragging my butt. But uh, yeah, so just love to en enjoy life and, and uh, love my family and my friends and helping, helping uh, other CML patients is another passion of mine. Um, I, yeah, I write, I knit, I crochet. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that, Michelle. Um, so I think the first thing is to rewind all the way back to 2010, 2011, when you first started feeling things were a little strange. Can you just give us a, a short summary of what you were feeling and, and what got you to finally go to the doctor to say, I need to check this out? Well, honestly, I had probably every symptom of, of leukemia and I explained away every single one. Um, like I mentioned before, I was dancing in Nashville at uh, the world competition in January and I was winded and I was tired and I kept asking what the elevation was and I didn't understand why I couldn't breathe and why was I so tired and I, I didn't realize it was because I had leukemia, but it, it that was a symptom and I just assumed it was because we had worked so hard to get there. So I had that. I had bruising, but I thought, oh, you're clumsy. Stop running into things. But I had these massive bruises. Didn't think anything of it. I had spots, kind of like a rash all over my body. And I, once again, checked for bed bugs, washed the sheets, you know, changed my laundry soap. I did all these things. So every single symptom that I had, while it was a symptom of leukemia, it just seemed like it was like a common Thing that could be happening. The night sweats, that kind of got me a little concerned because it was literally would wake up soaking wet. And I might, I had already, you know, been through that time in life and I, I'm like, well, maybe my hormones are wacky, but just night sweats, profuse of sweating. And then probably the biggest one was, um, I had an uncomfortable feeling under my left rib cage. And I, I kept telling my husband at night when I was reading, I'm like, God, things just don't feel like they fit the same in here anymore. I don't know why I'm so uncomfortable. So all of those things. And so I, I began to get a little concerned um, and still didn't really think something was wrong. And I went and I had an eye appointment for, for glasses and my optometrist started asking me these questions. He was like, do you have high blood pressure? No, I have low blood pressure. Do you have anemia? No, what's wrong? Why are you asking me these questions? And basically he said that there were capillaries that had burst inside my eyes. So he was concerned. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Am I going to go blind? He's like, no, you're not going to go blind. And he says, I don't think, um, but you should have it checked out. So uh, that was just another one of those things. Um, so I got through the competition. I got home and I had an appointment with my uh, regular checkup with my gynecological hematologist years before I had had borderline ovarian tumors. So in the back of my mind, I was kind of thinking that maybe this uncomfortable feeling in my abdomen might've been those tumors coming back. They've always said they could grow back. 
So that is where my mind went. Um, so I went and I told him and I explained all of these symptoms and he's like, well, let's do some blood work and do a CT scan tomorrow. That's, that's how it, that's how it, that's started. How it all began. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so you had these two appointments that were routine, but you're thinking, well, gosh, with all the symptoms now it's adding up to maybe this ovarian, um, almost tumors situation that you had before. Right. Um, okay. So, so talk to us about what, happened um after that i know it was kind of quick it was all it was february of 2011 and then it was like one day right after the other it was in the hospital mm -hmm. it absolutely was so i let so i ran across the hall and i got blood work it was five o'clock it was actually after five o'clock i got in the elevator it's kind of a funny story this doctor gets in behind me takes one look at me and says you okay and i'm like yeah i'm fine and he's like are you sure you're okay and i'm like yes i'm fine and i'm thinking to myself what do you mean do i not look okay that is what i'm thinking so we he gets out i get out i go home i get go to my parents house spend the night i get up in the morning the phone rings at 8 a.m and it's my um oncologist and he said Aunt michelle i don't know how to tell you this but you have leukemia he says, I need you to go to the emergency room. I have a doctor waiting there for you. And I'm like, wait, what? No, I, what do you mean? I have a look at me. You know, it was so far removed, so shocking. I, I just was, and I was in the bathroom actually brushing my teeth. So I'm standing there <laughs> looking in the mirror with the phone in my hands going, you're looking at it. And I'm like, how do you know? That was my first question. How do you know? He said, your white count is high. And I'm like, how high? He said, astronomically high. And I said, what does that mean? And he says, your white count's over 385,000, normal is four to 10. I need you to go straight to the emergency room. And so I, I'm like, uh, well, can I drive myself there? And he said, I really would like you to get a ride. We're afraid your brain's going to start to bleed. About this time, I'm thinking to myself, you know, yeah, I better get dressed and you better just go. So I went and I asked my dad to give me a ride to the, <laughs> to the hospital. I'm like, apparently I have leukemia. And uh, I got there and they were waiting for me and they put me right into the ER. And I'm in there for about an hour. They ran some blood work and the curtain opens up. Who's standing there? But that doctor from the elevator. And I said, it's you. And he said, it's you. He says, I didn't think you looked okay. And I said, what was it about me? And apparently he said, I was very pale and just looked sick. It, it, was, it was just so crazy. And of course, at that time, I didn't know what type, I didn't know there were several, I didn't know there were many different types of leukemia. I knew nothing about leukemia. I knew it was a blood cancer and that was it. This was 10, 11 years ago. And I didn't, ha I didn't have a smartphone, I didn't have an iPad, I, I didn't have a laptop, I had nothing. So I kept bugging the nurses to put in leukemia. I, I'm like, I know you can print this stuff off for me. And fortunately, I was right across from their little station there and they just kept printing off information um, for me for leukemia. And I started reading all this stuff and thinking, what do I do? You know, what do I do? Am I gonna live? Am I gonna die? What, what next? Those are, thank you for that. That's the summary of, I think the, the few questions that go through all of our heads once we get a yeah. diagnosis of cancer, right? Yeah. Um, can you bring us back before we move on to all the things that had to happen after? I mean, you were brushing your teeth, you get a phone call, you have leukemia. Uh, you have to rush to the hospital. You're told your brain might bleed. I mean, all these things. Um, at what point did it really hit you, hit you? I mean, where you could really sit and process the emotion. So you're, you know, you, you, you knew what you had to do, but when did it actually hit you emotionally? And can you bring us back to that time? You know, it probably wasn't until I actually was in my room and left alone. You know, you just look in the mirror and you just kind of go, I have cancer. I have leukemia. I probably did that. I probably still do that to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and it probably wasn't until I had to tell my children and make that phone call um, that it really, the, the gravity of the situation um, actually hit me because at first it was just, like, what do I need to do? I mean, what do I need to do? Okay, this is where we are. This is what I have. Now I need to, I need to fix this. <laughs> 
right. well, we're women, right? We fix things, right? right? No, no. So um, it was like, what do we do? Where do I go? How do you know what, what's next? And, and so you kind of stay on autopilot for a while. But as the tests, as they do the bone marrow biopsy and the different tests, and they get the, the complete diagnosis of what type of leukemia and all of that, and you start, now you're starting to feel really sick. And it, it's in those wee hours of the morning when nobody else is around that I think the gravity of the situation actually hits you. Um, Michelle, yeah. thank you so much for that. Um, as, as you alluded to just now, there were a series of tests that had to be done before they could determine what kind of leukemia you were dealing with. And so if I could summarize, I mean, there was a lot of different blood work happening, of course. Yes. You also had the bone marrow biopsy that was um, you know, a big part of a lot of, for blood cancers in general, it's a big part of the process. Um, let, you know, we, have, we don't have to go too in the weeds, but if you were to help give some guidance to people who are about to go through a bone marrow biopsy or wondering about it, what would you, what would you say? <laughs> I would say under no circumstances, let them do it without sedation. And um, my first one was without sedation. I balked a little, not loud enough. Um, so it was, in my opinion, for me, I have really hard bones, pretty brutal. Um, so I would <laughs> say use sedation. My second bone marrow biopsy, my doctor was like, of course will sedate, lightly sedate you because he, he felt it was barbaric to do it otherwise. Um, so that would be my, my Your tip. strongest, um, <laughs> yeah. Your advice. strongest recommendation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> because it's not fun. Yeah, no, it's not fun for sure. Um, and I love that already in a couple different points. So early in this experience of yours, you've got these moments of self-advocacy. The first one was, telling the nurses, I need you to print the information for me now. The second one um, that strikes me is this one, right? Saying, yeah. hey, everyone ask for sedation. They will let you know what the limit is, but they won't, you know, sometimes they don't ask you or whatever. And if you have that pain threshold, you know, you have, go for it. And, uh, and I am, I'm pretty good, but let me tell you what, they came in a big guy and a little guy. And I'm like, oh, that wants to hold me down. And you're the one to do the, do the thing. And he's like, pretty much. I, you know, had I known what I knew, I would have just said no. And they, you know, it's easier for them to just do it as opposed to having an anesthesiologist or somebody else there to have to monitor you more closely than they do otherwise. So it's easier for them, but, you know, we got to remember we do have rights and, and we can stand up for ourselves. And that was, boy, I tell you what, that made me go, I'm standing up for myself from here on out. I am never going to let that happen again. So it's a great learning moment. Oh yeah, it was. <laughs> sometimes that's what what has to happen to put yeah, it right? there. Right. Um, absolutely. I I and, and I know that next for you after that bone marrow biopsy, um, you know, with leukapheresis. Uh, which is a, a process, simply put, not medical terms, but you know, the white blood cell counts are so high, a way to try and, and get them reduced is to go through this process where they take the blood out, they take the white blood cells out, and they return the other parts of that blood to you without that. So it helps overall. Um, but you had to have a catheter put in for that. Uh, was Can you explain that to, to folks? Yes, they, uh, and boy, let me tell you, I made them explain every step of that process long before um, I let them touch me. Um, but they put it into your jugular vein here. They follow it um, through an ultrasound as they're putting it in. Uh, and it is, it's more uncomfortable probably than painful. Uh, it's put there, it, it's probably similar to a port that many people get when they have cancer. Um, but it's still, uh, it's a tube where it's sticking out of your neck where they connect that to and they take the blood out and they return it. Um, so that was, like I said, it was uncomfortable more than anything. It actually goes right into your heart, which is a little freaky. So when you, you know, having to think about that, but um, they were, they were good. And I asked lots of questions and made them explain everything very thoroughly before they started. So. Yeah. Good. Which speaks uh, to also everyone is different. Some people would rather not know and some yeah. people really want to know. And so just go with what you want, I think is the, yeah. the key there. And I did have a port. I also had a pick line, so I understand both. Um, 
did you, ha- how long did you have that catheter in? I had that for almost five days, five days, I believe it was. They took it out after they finished the treatment. Once my, tr- uh, once the leukapheresis, I had that for, I believe, four days in a row. Um, they, it takes hours. Uh, I mean, you're pretty much hooked up to this machine and somebody sits and watches it. And I guess it centrifuges out the white blood cells. Um, so you're there and you're just kind of, you know, stuck there in, in the bed and they do it for several hours a day and then they come back and do it again, because I guess it has to be done more slowly. Um, right. I can be done all at once. So right. I have right. that for like five days. Yes, five days. I did see that on your timeline that you sent with your dates. And so you had one, you had the bone marrow biopsy, the catheter put in, leukophoresis, and also your first cytarabine chemo yes. right before the days of February 10th, the day before that you actually got the official CML diagnosis. Can you talk about um, when the doctor finally did come to you and say, here's what you have, what that conversation was like, and and what... I don't know. Did, did anything change for you now that you knew exactly what leukemia? Um, I guess mostly what changes was now I had something I could actually read and understand. I knew exactly, you know, instead of it being vague leukemia, I knew it was this type of leukemia. So I, I researched that at that point, my husband had come over to Palm Springs, brought my computer. And so I was able to sit up and read and try to understand what it was I had, what it meant, um, what the treatment was, what the complications could be, um, and that sort of thing. So uh, that was helpful, actually, knowing that, I mean, on one hand, finding out that the type of leukemia I had was chronic, meaning I would have it the rest of my life, versus okay, I have cancer, I'm going to have treatment, I'm going to ring the bell, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to be done, right? So it's a little daunting thinking you're going to have cancer the rest of your life. And some people will refer to it as good cancer. I don't think any cancer is good. I'm like, fine, you think it's the right, you take it. I'll I'll, I'll just not have it. Um, But they don't realize the gravity of it, you know, and as time goes by people, you'll see people five years later and they're like, Oh, you're, you're doing something, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, well, I still have leukemia. And they're like, what? And they're confused because cancer is not supposed to last forever. So that was a little um, bit of a hard pill to swallow. Um, Forever's a long time. You hope it's a long time anyway. That's right, right, right. right. But I I really appreciate you highlighting this because that's right. You can have an acute leukemia, which is what you described as the sort of, you know, hopefully one and done, but it's, it's aggressive. There's an aggressive treatment and then hopefully you can ring the bell. That was more representative of the kind of, I had non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but that was more representative of that. Whereas you have chronic leukemia. And as you said, um, you know, this is, it's like dealing with a chronic illness um, is how people talk about it. And I also appreciate you bringing up the whole good cancer thing. Cause we hear that a number of times for, for various kinds of cancers and subtypes and situations. And let's just get that clear. There is no good cancer. Yeah. yeah. We, we know what people mean, I think, you know, and, and they think they mean well, but, uh, at the end yeah. of the day, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it doesn't, it's- Yeah. And, you know, when you're on a medication, that was one of my biggest concerns was here, I'm going to be on these strong medications. It's like an oral daily chemotherapy that you take every day for the rest of your life. You're like, okay, so what's that going to do to my heart? What's it going to do to my liver? What's it going to do to my kidney? You know, what's it going to do the rest of my body? And am I now at greater risk of other cancers, which appears to be fairly common? Um, people getting other cancers that have CML, um, is it going to damage my heart muscle? You know, so chances are I might not die from CML, but I might die from the treatment, which is also happens with other cancers as well. A lot of times it's the treatment. Um, that's what, you know. I think, you know, what you're pointing out too, is just that there are so many different factors and questions that enter the mind. Um, and, and so going back to the actual treatment, you got the official CML diagnosis. How did your, um, and at this point, it's a hematologist oncologist at this um, you know, hospital in Palm Springs. So not a huge yes. academic center or anything like that. Um, how did he or she describe the treatment um, 
now, like that needed to happen now. So there's the leukophoresis happening, but with a cytarabine, how did he or she describe that and then introduce the TKIs? Um, he basically said that he was using the leukophoresis and the cytarabine to bring down the white cell count quickly. Um, there was concern that there is what the third stage of uh, CML is called blast crisis, which in many cases in the past, it meant 100% of bone marrow transplant. Um, now they have come up with certain different TKIs that seem to get people out of blast crisis and back into a more chronic phase. Um, but at that time, it was, you know, are you going to need a, a, a TKI, which is the oral medication, or are you going to need a bone marrow transplant? So his main concern and goal was to get me to a stable position before trying the medications. Right. Thank you for setting that up because then that's clear to people that that was just um, a move to help get you to a place where then you could start your real treatment. Um, and I also appreciate you talking about these three phases uh, because they can really indicate the path to treatment for each person. So it's chronic, uh, accelerated, and blast, which is what you're talking about, which is the most sort of, oh my gosh, we need to really act fast. Right. Um, so before we move on to the second segment where we talk about the TKI and the treatments and um, more of this targeted therapy, I'd love to understand, you know, you, you had some switches, you made a switch, you started at the local hospital in Palm Springs, uh, again, a hematologist oncologist, but not a CML specialist. You made a decision to then go to City of Hope, um, at least for a second opinion first, right? Can you describe right. your thought process? Yes, I, at that point, I had decided that, uh, well, I realized that there were doctors, um, hematological blood cancer doctors that specialized in different types of leukemia. So I quickly became aware that there were people that specifically um, worked with CML patients. And my thought process at the time was, want to see someone who sees other CML patients, so they will have something to compare to, versus someone that only sees it once, you know, there's a really good chance that a, a, a hematological oncologist will never see a case of CML. At the time, there were, I think, 10,000 people living with CML is all. It was rare because prior to 10 years prior to that, people died quickly. So and now we, we have, now we have a much larger community, I think maybe 100,000 people. So it's a rare cancer. So I knew that. So I called City of Hope and I found that, yes, they had um, CML specialists. So I made an appointment there, which was closer to home. I was living in the LA area. So it was closer to home. And I thought, well, maybe I should go here. So I went there and I was mesmerized by the side of, size of it. They call it City of Hope. And it is a city. It is it's huge. It is run like a well-oiled machine. I mean, you go in, you meet this person, you get the badge, you get the blood work, you get sent over here, they do this, they do that. And it felt very methodical. And while the doctor was very thorough and she was on board with the treatment that my first died, you know, the doctor that diagnosed me, she was on board with that. And she agreed with the treatment. And she said, we just want to do weekly blood draws and make sure, you know, it's, this will be for several months and then come back and see me in a month. So I did do that. Um, and I saw her a second time, but I just didn't feel like, um, we had a connection that uh, with somebody that I wanted for the rest of my life because the CML, it's the rest of your life. So I needed some, I, I felt I needed somebody that I could talk to, somebody that would listen to me, somebody that would answer my questions, somebody that wouldn't get impatient, somebody I could reach when I was scared or had a question. I needed all those things. So I made another appointment um, and I ended up at UCLA. And two minutes into that conversation, I was like, okay, this works for me. You know, and he was very cautious of, I mean, I went as a second, third opinion, um, and he was very conscientious of not trying to say, you should come and be my patient at all. Um, he looked at it as, as a third opinion and pretty much agreed with the treatment, uh, but it was a connection for me. And so I, I switched doctors to go I, there. 
I really appreciate you here laying this all out too. It's so important to, to listen to your gut. If you have the time and ability to, to, and you had said doctor shop, which I think is, is again, critical. Um, you said two minutes in, what was it? It was just bedside manner. What was it? I think it was just bedside manner, comfortable, comfort. He was comfortable. He, he was like a human being. He was like a human being. He wasn't like the person that most people think of as a doctor. Doctors are human beings. They are no different than you and I. They have a degree. They're practicing medicine. They call it practicing for a reason. They don't know everything. They can't predict everything. They are human beings. And different people work and connect better with some people than others. And other people need different types of communication. And I needed somebody to meet me on a personal level. I needed somebody to um, consider that what I was saying was important. Whether it, wasn't, whether it was silly or not, it was important to me. And he didn't make me feel like it was frivolous or stupid or whatever. So he met me on a personal level. And so for me, that, that's important. I, I, I don't want to feel like my doctor is this person on a pedestal who I can't communicate with. I, and, and, and I could not agree with you more. I'm, I'm hopeful that the paradigm is shifting more quickly from that you know, unilateral or one directional sort of framework of doctor knows best to we understand your role. We also would love to be able to ask our questions and yeah. um, you know, be a part of our care. This yeah. is our lives, right? Yeah. So nobody yeah. knows your body more than you. I, I don't care. You know, they see you for a short period of time. You live with you every day.